Good to see you this morning on a lovely day for the month of October, and we do thank and praise the Lord for all of his blessings. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Heather, would you ask the Lord to bless our Sunday school, please? Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house on this lovely morning that you've given us. We ask that you bless the word, help us to apply it and learn more about you. Amen. Amen. Well, we're moving on into a new section of the scripture uh, this morning. Starting this morning, we're starting to look at the book of Ephesians. Um, and so I thought we would begin just with a very brief historical look, uh, just so that we understand uh, the book itself. Uh, we're looking at chapter 1, but we're actually going to start, I want you to turn with me please to chapter 19 of Acts. Acts chapter 19, please, this morning, because uh, we want to see uh, the book of Ephesians was written by Paul. Uh, we understand and we believe that Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus um, from Rome. This is during the time of his house arrest, uh, that uh, he is under uh, arrest there in Rome. Uh, when he is writing to the church in Ephesus. And he did a lot of writing as a way of encouraging. Couldn't pick up the phone, uh, couldn't send a text message or anything of that nature. Um, so it was the written word uh, that was the key way to communicate. We think that he's writing the book of Ephesus, or Ephesians, sorry. He's writing approximately 60 years after the birth of Christ. Um, and so this is after the crucifixion, uh, this is during the time of persecution that the disciples were um, feeling as they continued to share the word. But uh, before he writes to the church of Ephesus, he visited them. And we find that account in the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 19, <coughs> I just want to read uh, some verses here, starting at verse 1 so that we understand what the groundwork was that Paul had laid uh, for the church, for God's people there in Ephesus. So Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And they went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated and the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, what we see there is um, the growing of God's church. Um, and Paul was very involved in that. And he was involved in, in not only laying foundations, but then helping the church to continue to mature and to continue to grow. So we see that they were traveling, and Paul ends up in Ephesus. And it's interesting, I hope you noted, that there were already disciples there. In other words, there were already some Christians there, not many. It tells me there were 12 uh, at the time when he baptized. Um, and you'll see there that they had a certain degree of knowledge, 
but they didn't have full understanding. Now, Paul doesn't rebuke them for that. He doesn't put them down for that. He doesn't condemn them for that. What he does is he proceeds in love to continue to help them to grow and to understand. And this is something I think that we have to look at as God's people. There's nobody here, myself included, that understands the word of God completely. No one. We make mistakes. Um, and I pray and hope and ask the Lord to help us all to continue to see more of his word each and every day. That's the growing process. And there are times when we're growing, and uh, you may know this from your growing experience and things that you've tried to do, that you fail. Um, that you, you fall, you, you have an injury of some sort, a setback, but that doesn't mean that we stop. And Paul sees these disciples, sees this very, very young church, and he helps them to grow in the idea of baptism, and we see the Holy Spirit is poured out, and they prophesy, uh, as it says there, you know, and, and so God is definitely moving. It tells us they had tongues, and so the Holy Spirit was moving. All of this I want to share with you to show you that there's a church that's growing in Ephesus. And Paul is involved in that. As a matter of fact, we see that he begins to teach, and then there is um, an upheaval, right? Right? You're not always going to have a smooth road. Not everybody is going to agree. So they let Paul sort of get started, but then we see that after a few months, there is a disruption there, right? And so Paul pulls away actually from the synagogue, which would have been the Jewish center. Paul leaves that, and he goes to this different school, uh, as it points out, and then he stays there in that area for two years teaching and working. I take from that that some things happen quickly, but other things take time. And, you know, so for me, that the Lord is saying, be patient. Paul taught for two years in this particular location, helping the the church to grow, helping the disciples that were there to see. And we understand that God was continuing to move through that. And then if you continue to read there, we're not going to. But we see miracles taking place. And then we have the account of the seven sons of Sceva, which is a little further in that particular chapter, where we see people trying to imitate um, God's power and, and all of these things happening. So there was probably not very, you know, I was going to say not a day, but perhaps there was a day. Uh, there wouldn't have been a long period of time without some form of conflict, without some little upheaval, without a place where Paul, with God's blessing and leadership, had to correct and sort of put people back on the right track. That's the Christian journey. And we have to understand it. We have to be patient with it. I believe we have to be forgiving of one another, not judging one another. Sometimes we're very, very quick. We jump to conclusions really, really fast. And that can create a lot of hard feelings and actually cause much more damage than the original problem that was there in the first place. So, in patience, Paul works with these people in Ephesus, and then he leaves, right? He lays a foundation, um, but just because Paul leaves, it doesn't mean that the work doesn't continue. And just because Paul leaves, it doesn't mean that the enemy leaves, all right? Satan doesn't leave God's people alone. He wasn't just after Paul, he was after the entire ministry. Okay, so the devil wanted to put an end to the whole thing. So when we pick this up in, Ephes in Ephesians, pardon me, so to go to Ephesians chapter 1, Paul himself now is going through some hard times. Right? He's under house arrest. 
Now they chose not to put him in a dungeon. They didn't put him in a jail. I suppose this was a little bit of a political move. That's my interpretation, you know, but uh, it, it would have been perhaps created a, more of an upheaval among the Christians um, had they placed him in, in a dungeon directly, but he was on house arrest. And uh, so he couldn't go where he wanted to go. Um, he always had somebody guarding his home, uh, but he was allowed to communicate. And so Paul takes advantage of the situation. And to be completely honest, we should be thankful, in a sense, that Paul ends up under house arrest because this is when Paul does a lot of his writing. And those are the letters that end up being part of the scripture that we have today. So I'm kind of putting two and two together in my mind. Had Paul not been under house arrest, perhaps he would not have written. Uh, perhaps the Lord would not have seen fit to have him um, write these things down or for them to be preserved. Um, so in a sense, you see, it's a good example where what we see as a negative, God is actually using as a positive. Now Paul, as he's writing these letters, he would not have had any idea that God's plan was to put them all together in a book and to have them uh, published around the world for God's children. But God knew that was happening. Uh, and so again, I'm reminded, okay, so I'm going through something today. I don't understand how this could be a positive, but I'm going to make the best of it. And I'm going to continue to do God's work regardless of how that might look like. This was, you know, for Paul, this was not his natural form of ministry. May I say that? Are you following? Are you, are you with me? Okay. For a preacher, for an evangelist, for a pastor, what I'm doing right now, this is the natural form of ministry. But the world at the time said to Paul, you can't do that. So Paul didn't stop. Paul didn't say, okay, I can't do anything anymore. I believe God led him to transform, in a sense, his ministry so that he could continue to touch the souls of the people that he had been working with. So he ends up writing to the church in Ephesus. That's a pretty long letter. He didn't write short little letters. Uh, they were long. And they were full of a lot of details, often reminders. And we are blessed to be able to look at that this morning. So, in Ephesians chapter 1, which is our text for this particular uh, study that we're doing this morning, there are some things that I want to point out to you as we go through. There are just 23, <coughs> excuse me, 23 verses. But they contain a great deal for which we must be thankful uh, there are a lot of reminders here about what the Lord has done for us. As I was reading through this, I thought, really, this is the perfect chapter for Thanksgiving. And we just had our Thanksgiving uh, on the calendar, but we know that as God's people, Thanksgiving is every day. Um, there shouldn't be a day where you don't wake up and say, thank you, Lord, uh, for protecting me through the night and giving me another day. Uh, and now, Lord Jesus, how can I worship, how can I serve you this day? Um, and so Paul uh, writes and he begins in verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So Paul always made sure that he... Um, would send his letter and start his letter by making sure we knew who he was and whom he was writing to. I have circled in my Bible and put a star by the will of God, that phrase there. Um, that's really key 
And it seems to me that as I was reading through this particular chapter, and if, as you read uh, Paul's work, uh, and the other disciples as well, this idea that everything needs to be done by the will of God. You know, if we could just take that piece and apply that to everything that we do, you know, I think not only will we see the blessings of the Lord, uh, but the growth that God can also provide. But remembering, it's all by His will. It's all uh, according to what the Lord wants to do. Now, some people have a problem with that, um, and perhaps that's one of the big issues they have with Christianity in general, is that we as Christians submit ourselves to the Lord. We say, I am God's servant. I am not the head, I'm not the master, I'm not in charge, but I am willing to be under the direction of the Lord. And I think it's so critical that Paul, who was a real powerhouse in the work of the Lord, always seems to make those statements that remind us that no matter how important we think Paul was, Paul sets us straight and makes sure we understand he's just a servant of the Lord. And it's all done according to his will. Now, I'm going to just uh, break this chapter apart a little bit. Because what I've done here, and there may be some other examples, but the ones that jumped out to me, I've circled this idea by the will of God, and then I've written down verse 5, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 19. And what I was trying to do there is, as I read through this, I noticed phrases <laughs> that continue to support that what Paul was talking about was always about the will of God. So, in verse 5... I'm not going to read the whole verse, but just to point out to you, it says, according to the good pleasure of his will. Right? You'll see that. In verse 7, it says again, according to the riches of his grace. In verse 9, partway in, it says, to his good pleasure. And in verse 19, he says, um, to the working of his mighty power. And so those verses, to me, all combine to support how Paul was always trying to be under God's direction. Now you'll notice I, I've said, and I purposely said, always trying to be under God's direction. And I say that because I remember, and I have to remind myself, and Paul wouldn't be offended by this, I don't think, in any way. We have to remember, Paul was a human being. He was a man, he was a person, like you are a person. He's part of God's creation. Um, and as I said before, we make mistakes. That means Paul did too. Um, however, his desire was always to be a part of God's plan. Okay, To be under God's direction. We need to take time to check out what God wants us to do. Not jump. You know, some people are pretty, you know, spontaneous. You know, they talk about people who purchase things just on a whim and, and very, very quickly do things. I think as God's people, um, there is wisdom in being patient. And there's wisdom in stepping back and always checking with God first. In a sense, if you need to think about it this way, and this is perhaps more the generations that we're in now, um, the, the newer, the younger folks, um, who tend to have this thing with them all the time. I'm talking about a phone, okay? Or some form of communication. And are checking this often, okay? 
Now, I confess, I do that too. I don't like to I see my emails get out of control. I check it for the weather. Uh, you know, I, I check it for a lot of different things. My analogy, what I'm trying to say to you is, imagine that God is with us in that same way. Now, that's much more important, right? But if you check your phone or you check the computer or you check the news, on a regular basis during the day, right? Before you head out in the morning, do you check what the weather's going to be? Um, do you, do you, you know, find out what's the temperature going to be? <clears throat> Things that you do that help you to make decisions, right? Well, make sure God is number one on that list. Make sure that you're checking with Him multiple times during the day. You know, what should I do here? And it doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to be, you know, that you need to kneel down somewhere in the store or anything like that. God hears your prayer, um, and it doesn't have to be flowery. I'm just suggesting to you, you know, let's make sure we're checking in with him. Before you, you go on a trip, you pray. Before you go into the store, maybe when you pull into the parking lot. You know, I'm not saying I do these things all the time. These are just things I'm now bringing to my own attention. Wouldn't this be a good idea? I'm going shopping. How about I pray just before I leave the car? Lord, if there are any deals to be had, I'd love to have them. Amen. Right? You know, Lord, I'm trying to make a decision about whether I purchase this or that, or I need a new whatever it is. Um, Lord, help me to make the right choice. Simple. But so critical, I think, with regards to making God a part of our lives, not just an accessory. God isn't an accessory God is supposed to dwell within us. And so if we take the time, and it might take some practice at first, okay? We all have to work on our routines. And, and being a Christian involves learning to do some of these things and asking God about what might seem to be kind of mundane little things, and yet, if we do that for the smallest things, what we think are the smallest things, then it becomes so much easier for us to also ask God for the big things. And we recognize that he's with us always. So Paul provides us with lots of examples of that. Now, as we go through here, starting at verse 2, you're going to see blessings. Uh, blessing after blessing after blessing. Friday, uh, Friday's message that I just preached a couple days ago was, was on showers of blessing, right? And the, the idea that you can be in the rain, but if you have your umbrella or your raincoat, you're not going to get wet. In God's house, we want to get wet by His Spirit. Forget about your raincoat, forget about your image, forget about... You know, the pretending that you might be doing, all those things, you should leave them outside the door. Better yet, you should bring them to the altar and then leave them there, right? But we want the showers of blessing to fall upon us. And really, this is another great chapter because, just look at the next verse. Grace be to you and peace from our God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So right away... Paul's talking about two blessings, grace and peace. They don't come from anywhere else in truth except from the Lord. And as we go through this uh, chapter, that's what we see over and over and over again. And Paul really uh, provides a lot of reminders here. Number th Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so now he just sort of speaks in general about spiritual blessings, right? Remembering that what we have is from the Lord. 
According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now I need to stop here and just um, jump to verse 11 where it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This word, predestined, causes some people a bit of a stumble. So we want to make sure we understand what Paul is really talking about here. Okay? Um, and this is another good example, as I get into this, where you have to take the entire Bible, you look at the scriptures in the Bible, to help us interpret meaning and full understanding. If you pull one verse and you use definitions, and you know I like to use definitions, but you use definitions of today, and you try and hang that on your idea of how things should go, you could be going the wrong way. So, non-believers, or those that would be critical of the Bible, will look at this word predestined, will look at these two verses, and they will suggest, and I'm going to suggest to you wrongly or falsely, that what this means is that God has chosen ahead of time those that are going to be saved and those that are not going to be saved. That's how they interpret that, right? Because predestined uh, suggests something that was determined ahead of time. Now, if I say that to you, that God has chosen those that will be saved ahead of time, and God has chosen those that will not be saved ahead of time. Does that fit in your mind with the rest of Scripture? And to me, the answer is no. It does not. You can find all kinds of examples in the Scripture where Jesus himself speaks of he's come to save the lost. Right? He's come to uh, save not those that are already righteous, but those that are not. I'm paraphrasing there. Okay, so there is no suggestion that I can see within the word of Jesus or anywhere else in the scripture that talks about the fact that before Roger was born, God said, hmm, I think I'll pick Roger to be saved. But before Eugene was born, I hope nobody here has a name. Uh, that before Eugene was born, no, I'm condemning him before he was born. There is no place in scripture that suggests that, okay? So, <clears throat> from what I've said so far and from our understanding of the Bible in general, that means that this word predestined isn't referring to people. And that's important. And when somebody comes to you and says, oh, the Bible says God chose ahead of time who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, and therefore, what's the point? You see, that's the excuse then that people make, right? Well, there's no point. God's already decided. God has decided what the plan of salvation is. God has decided what the inheritance for those that are saved is to be. God has decided that those that are saved will have life eternal in glory with him. That is predestined. Okay? So it's not the people that are predestined. It is the plan that God has made is predestined. It is the fact that those that make the choice to be saved now, there is a predestined path. And if you stop and think about this, this shouldn't, shouldn't be that hard for us to understand, 
Because Jesus himself said that there is one way and only one. See, that's predestined. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's predestined. And the fact that Satan is going to be defeated is predestined. These are decisions, these are things that God has already decided. Okay? But in his wisdom, which sometimes we might not understand, God has said, every soul has a choice. That part, I suppose you could say every, cho every soul has a choice, is predestined. But what that choice is, is up to each and every person, okay? And so when Paul writes here, okay, having predestined us unto the adoption of children, and notice how he phrases that, having predestined us unto the adoption of children. So in other words, once we are saved, we are now predestined, the choice has been made that we are going to be God's children. We are going to be considered adopted. Okay? We are going to have, as it says in verse 11, all right, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. It was predestined. It's kind of like if you have a will and I have a will, before we pass away, we decide whom we are going to offer certain things to. Right? Who's going to get this? Who's going to get that? Etc. Um, how is what I have, whatever it might happen to be, going to be divided? That's predestined. Okay. And you decide, you put a name. Okay? But what God did is he just said, my children. My children shall receive an inheritance. My children will have life everlasting. And then he gives you and me a choice. Are you going to be one of his children? If so, God puts your name in the book of life. And now everything that he has determined or predestined as being a gift or a blessing to those in the book of life is now yours. Because your name is there. God did not decide ahead of time that my name was going to be there. But he did give me a choice. Once it's there, now the path has been set as long as I abide in his will. Okay? And so this is what Paul is talking about here. And as he says again at the end of verse 5, according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay? This is all in God's plan. In verse 6 it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood. So here he's speaking of Jesus. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. All right? And we all understand and we have to be reminded, if you're looking for something to be thankful for, you know, the salvation gift is beyond anything that anybody could ever give you, right? And so Paul reminds here the, the believers in Ephesus that God give us redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins according to his riches of his grace. God didn't have to. Uh, this evening's message, just to give you a little uh, perhaps intrigue, uh, is going to be about investment um, in the sense that, you know, I was just pondering, I won't give the whole message away, but this idea about did God have to invest in you and me, uh, and is he getting anything out of it that he really needs? Um, and so we'll look at that this evening, uh, but really it's all because of his grace, all right, his love. It doesn't have anything to do with what we can give back to him. Because if I, as I've said before, in truth, God doesn't need anything that I can give him. He's got it all. 
And so it's just really for us that we have the opportunity to serve him uh, and to praise him. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now again, you know, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but really this whole chapter is, is a series of repetitions. What does Paul say there? Right? He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about knowledge. And then he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So God is the one who opens my eyes. This is one of the things where we have to be very careful. There's absolutely nothing wrong with study of the Word of God. We're encouraged to do that, right? So in that sense, there's nothing wrong with you taking a course, with you uh, sitting in, you know, once we get to a certain lovely age, uh, you can sit in to any university course without paying any kind of a fee. Um, you won't get any credit for it, but you can garner the knowledge that's there or the lack thereof. Um, my point is, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having a theological degree or anything of that nature. But what we have to remember is all of that study is limited by this mind right here. Okay? It's not until God, by His Holy Spirit, reveals His will, or as Paul puts it here, the mystery of His will, it's not until God does that, that we start to really have understanding. Okay? So, the old sort of saying, you can have a lot of book knowledge, but do you have any practical experience whatsoever? Okay? And as Christians, we need both. Right? You can memorize the Bible, good for you. It's going to do zero. Absolutely zero for you. Unless it's alive. Okay? Unless God's Spirit takes the words that you have memorized and anoints them and shows you that there's power in that word. Okay? And so there are a lot of people who study to be pastors. There are a lot, and good for them. We need that. But more than all of the hours that they might spend in a classroom or even working in the field, it's not until. God's Holy Spirit anoints them, Amen. all right? And then you recognize, and people need to do this. We need to recognize, I'm not very smart. Absolutely not compared to God. And so we always want his direction, okay? His direction, and that's what Paul is talking about there when he speaks about that in verse 9, okay? Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now he's talking here really about revelation, right? He's talking about the end time, when all these things come together in Christ. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. May I just jump in there for a second? You know, often, we don't really know what we're going to inherit before the, the will is read, right? Most wills are kept private. Now, you might speak to some people ahead of time, you know, to let them know, or I've had experience with some individuals that know they are going to pass, and they, they sort of divvy out their inheritance before they pass away, because it takes some, gives them some pleasure to share what they have with individuals while they're still able to see the joy that that might give, all right? But there are other parts of a will that are private, and it's not until the person passes away that the will is revealed, okay? So, if you're like me, I'm curious about what the will might say. 
In particular, I'm talking now about the spiritual will, right? And so we get little glimpses from God. And these little blessings, when I'm, and I'm saying little blessings because I believe we really can't comprehend how great the blessing is, how wonderful the inheritance truly is. Okay? You have an idea in your head. I might have an idea in my head. And even, you know, the apostles and John and Revelation, they got a little picture, a little glimpse of how wonderful heaven was going to be, how wonderful it would be to worship with all the saints, okay? And then we, we have this idea that we're trying to grasp. What does eternity mean? How long is it? And as soon as I say that, I'm off base. Eternity has no length because it's forever, right? So we're, we try and we think, wow, it's going to be so amazing in heaven. And to be honest, I don't think we even have a clue. Now I'm saying that to you as a way to try and say, we need to be even more thankful than you think you have to be. Because we don't have a clue what the full inheritance is going to be. Okay? But we can thank God that he has, in fact, created that inheritance for us, and he says that you can have it and that I can have it if we are of his family, part of his family, okay? Let's jump down to verse 13. It says, in whom, uh, maybe I better read verse 12 too, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This verse to me tells me, and I share with you, that there is nothing more important than sharing the word of God. Okay? Paul makes it clear here, right? In whom, he's speaking there of Christ, in whom he also trusted, and then notice he says, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel. Okay? We can never, never, never Stop sharing the gospel. It is the foundation. It is the piece, the part that makes a difference. All right? It is the part that saves souls because the word of God penetrates. All right? It's like a drill. It's like a spear. It's like that two-edged sword like the Bible speaks about. It's something that nothing can hold back it can get in, and then it makes a difference. Okay. And Paul here is saying that the preaching of the gospel is what resulted in these people coming in faith to trust and believe in the Lord. They needed that. That's the way God has set things up. Okay. And so, you know, Nothing can take its place, I guess is basically it. No form of entertainment, uh, no pleasures, nothing. The gospel message is key, all right? And so I've got that down there, and again, as an encouragement to you and to me, keep testifying. Don't stop, okay? Again, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be your entire life story. But we want to continue to let people know that the one who made a difference in my life is Christ. That's it. Okay? And then we can get into detail about how, but that's the piece. It's the gospel that changes things. Okay? And then he says here in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I put a couple stars there 
And again, because we just came through Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, just a, a, something to keep in mind. I found it good and a reminder that here Paul says, giving thanks for you. We can give thanks for our house, we can give thanks for our food, we can give thanks for our clothes, we can give thanks for our health, we can give thanks for all kinds of things. Don't we do that? I pray that you do. Do we give thanks for one another? That's what I'd like you to think about. That's what I'd like you to consider. Okay? Because Paul focuses in on the people. Right? Remember, he's in jail. He's in bondage. He's going through persecution. The disciples were going through trials. They were going through tasks. And yet, in everything, he gives thanks for the people. We are important as a body. And we have to cherish that, thank God for that, and perhaps we need to do better at giving thanks for one another. Okay? Not taking for granted that so-and-so is always going to be there, and somebody's always going to do this, or somebody's always going to do that. Guess what? That may not always be the case. All right? And so we need to give thanks, as Paul says, for you, and we need to pray one for another. You know? So, you know, I pray for, I ask God to help me with my strength, I ask God to help me with this and help me with that, etc. Let's make sure we take time to pray for one another. And in doing so, we give thanks, right? You know, I'm thankful that God uh, has brought you out, and I'm thankful that I'm part of what? The family of God. What is a family of God? A family of God is a group of people. And when you're not there, or not here, I miss you. We should. We should miss one another. We should be concerned about one another. Okay? Not gossiping. But we should be, because we love one another, as part of the family of God, praying. Okay? And let me just close and finish up here, as I know we're finished. But I want to go to verse 18. And here again, um, he's speaking about, in verse 17, he says about wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So Paul knew that this was really important. Okay? Um, and and uh, this is something that we have to, I, I know we recognize this particularly as we get a little bit older. We recognize we're never going to know everything. Have you figured that out? Absolutely, right? I mean, there's just, you know, and, and, and uh, in truth, this is just my perhaps crazy way of thinking, you know, as I look at my age, and some of you will say, oh, you're, you got nothing, you know, you're still so young, etc. Yes, okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, I appreciate that. Um, I don't know that there are enough years left to do everything that I want to do. I don't know if you ever think that. I do, okay? And maybe that's not the way I should think, all right? But for me, what that means is, there's so much life to live, there's so much to learn, there's so much to do, and that's why I keep saying to my wife, where did this day go? How can it be this time already? I don't, you know, and I know I've done a whole bunch of things, and yet it never seems like I've done enough. Okay? It just goes so fast. Right? And it just, like we know, continues to go that fast until the day the Lord calls us home. Right? Um, but my point is here that... Paul is speaking about wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And this is the piece where we can never get enough. Okay, let me just put it that way. All right? And, and I've said this before, but, and I don't mean it in a bad way. Uh, 
I never want to be satisfied with what the Lord has shared with me so far. Now, that's not to say I'm not thankful for it, okay? But I always ask the Lord, every time, every day, every time I look at the scripture, give me a little bit more. Give me a little bit more. Like the little boy with the bowl. More, please. Right? Really, we come to the Lord, right? And he's given us much of which we say, thank you. What a great blessing we have. And yet every day, we should be coming, can I have a little bit more? Can you take me a little bit deeper? Just one verse. Just one little morsel. And what Paul does here in those verses there, we don't have time to look at them too closely, but if you read 18 and 19, he speaks about hope, riches, and power. Okay? And he highlights those three areas there of an increase in revelation of knowledge with regards to hope, uh, with regards to riches of glory, and then power that the Lord has. And, you know, Paul continues on, and in the next weeks we're going to continue on through Ephesians, just to glean from the letters that he wrote to this, what is really still a very young church, what he wrote to them to encourage them. So, you know, may the Lord encourage you uh, through his scripture, um, and, you know, let us thank him today, another day, to give him thanks for all that he has done. I don't know what your week was like. I don't know hardships, pain, ache, whatever it happens to be, you know. Um, but you're here today. And, and God made a way. And he's blessed us to be able to be here today. We don't know if we can be here tomorrow. We don't. So we have to take advantage of the time that God has given us today to give him praise honor and glory. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's get ready to do that then through the remainder of our service.